This is an interview with Professor Richard Brooks about the research he did on the Chicago Historical Homicide Project when he was a professor of law at Northwestern University School of Law. He's now a professor of law at Yale University School of Law. Um, his research was involved with sentencing patterns of judges and its relationship to um, election of judges uh, in Chicago, which was a very important process. And he did a, a, an extensive quantitative study with a colleague at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Richard, tell us what first interested you about these historical data and how you became involved in this research. I had initially been focused on doing research looking at the black church on the south side of Chicago. Um, I was, my interest actually was more contemporary than anything. I was curious why African American churches were involved in as, uh, so much community redevelopment. Why were they building houses, shopping centers, and so forth? And it actually turned out to have strong historical roots. Uh, for a variety of reasons, the African American church were able to put together resources and uh, um, overcome legal and non-legal barriers uh, historically in Chicago and um, putting and constructing um, buildings and property development. And what we've seen is just a continuation of that pattern. Richard, what kind of legal and non-legal barriers were African-American churches able to overcome because they were churches? Well, largely the principal uh, legal barrier was the, uh, their ability to get around racial restrictive covenants. Uh, these are agreements among property owners not to sell, lease, allow occupancy or use of their property by people of specified religions, nationalities, or race. Um, these uh, churches would incorporate and therefore become legal persons. And as legal persons, they could buy and own property. And also as legal persons, they were deemed to not be raced so that they didn't face the restriction when it came to uh, enforcing that um, covenant. Richard, why didn't more people use this legal device to get around these sort of restrictive covenants? Uh, was there a reason for that? Oh yeah, they were used broadly. Initially, uh, they were used against Chinese Americans in California uh, in the late 1800s. And then it just started spreading wide, widely, um, largely in um, northeastern, midwestern, and many southern cities. I think the need to use that um, sort of became less significant because the use restriction. So even though the property could be sold, it still couldn't be used by African Americans. There's a, a very interesting case of a church in Ohio in the, I believe, 1943, who uh, they purchased, uh, it was a church with a mixed congregation and a black minister. They purchased the property covered by one of these covenants, and the court said, of course, the church can buy the property, but the black minister could not live on the property. So the use restriction uh, really served to allow uh, the, the, the functionality of the covenant is originally structured. And it turns out that this was actually used in places like South Africa too. Uh, not, not the covenant per se, but an incorporation uh, uh, to avoid the covenant. Uh, and the statutes were passed later in, in uh, apartheid South Africa too, well, to defeat that. Of course, housing conditions and living conditions have been related to aspects of crime and poverty for a very long time, and they were very important during the period that we're working with, 1870 to 1930. And many of these c crime commission reports, such as the Illinois Crime Survey and the 1915 Crime Commission report, talk in great detail about how the housing conditions influence crime. Absolutely, Lee. In fact, it was my work on the churches and the housing that led me to, the, to this particular data, to your data set. Um, I became interested in looking at the riots related to housing. Most of the riots in, in Chicago's um, history during this period of the late uh, 1800s through the mid-1950s were related to housing. And the 1919 riot was a particularly poignant story for me. Uh, it involved uh, Eugene Williams, uh, who uh, uh, swam across an imaginary line separating a black Southside beach from a white Southside beach and was stoned. 
um, and, and later uh, was stoned by some of the um, beachgoers on the white side and really ignited the 1919 uh, race riots. So looking at that was what really brought me into wanting to know a little bit more about these individual cases and, and explore the riots more carefully. Now, uh, when I started looking at the data set, we didn't know what we would find exactly. Uh, we knew there was a, it was a rich and detailed history of these, of these cases, and I, again, thought it would be focused more on crime and the riots. I didn't think it would sort of pull me in the direction that it ultimately did, which was more politics and judicial elections than anything else. Richard, tell us how the work you had done previously in this area led you to focus on the particular subject you and your colleague ended up doing research on? Yeah, my colleague Steve Raphael at UC Berkeley and I, uh, and Steve's in the Goldman School uh, at UC Berkeley, we had worked on different projects focusing, um, using largely economic econometric techniques on broad data sets. I'd been focusing on uh, the use of housing prices and the values in which, uh, and the changes in values of housing prices based on the enforceability of these r racial restrictive covenants. Steve looked at transportation and access to transportation and its impact on employment opportunities uh, for people living in central city um, communities. Uh, we imagined initially that we would have a similar focus uh, when we started with this project, use a large data set, see what kind of patterns we can identify, see if there are any statistical s significance associated with it. Uh, that's how my interest in the project started, and, and in some ways that's where it concluded um, for the project that Steve and I uh, were working on. But since then, I've come to look at this type of research in a very different way. Um, I've come to recognize a connection between sort of methodological merger that, was, that this data set sort of allowed for me to do very careful empirical work, uh, statistical uh, uh, analyses of, of data while at the same time being able to go back and uncover the history, the specifics of it, so to allow me to really sort of lend more credence to the assumptions that I need to generate my broader statistical results. Uh, it's, uh, it's changed the way I, 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 I do research currently. It's interesting how a data set like this can bring you to challenge your assumptions. Somehow it's easier to look at things a little bit differently when you're working with the historical materials, ma materials that are distant from you. Yeah, actually one of the strongest assumptions that, not just uh, as an assumption held by myself, but many people in Chicago that I talk about, is this notion of Chicago politics being incredibly corrupt mm -hmm. during uh, the, this period uh, mm -hmm. of, of the study. And one of the results, of, of course, that we find in our analysis is that a defendant, a criminal defendant, is much more likely to receive a death sentence when the sentence is handed down during the trial judge's election year. Uh, now, so many people thought elections simply didn't matter, and that really challenged that assumption going into it. Maybe their elections did matter. Another interesting thing, and another sort of assumption that really I had challenged and cleared up through this analysis is that these decisions were being made largely by judges. But in fact, while we are observing this sort of election year effect, it turns out that the juries were the ones that were making the decision on, the, 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 on capital punishment. So it required sort of a, a new story, uh, figuring out what's, going, what's, what's really explaining these, the, this particular outcome. If judges weren't doing it, if elections didn't matter, why would we observe such a strong, and, and, and it really was quite strong. We tried our best to uh, come up with a, a model specification to defeat the result, but it was, it was much more robust. Uh, then um, it, it was significantly robust. We couldn't get rid of the result. And what you found was? That essentially during a, uh, the trial judge's election year, the chances of receiving uh, a capital punishment as opposed to a life sentence goes up by 15%. That's a pretty large number, a pretty significant effect. It, it's not only large in magnitude, but it's significant statistically. That, that is, we have a high degree of confidence that this is not just some random uh, uh, association. 
The results you found about the differences between blacks and whites and the racial effects um, and sentencing, of course, continue to the present day. And a great deal of quantitative work that's been done in Texas and Illinois demonstrates that amply. Uh, so that's not surprising. But you know, one of the interesting things that this work raises is the difference between hard data and soft data. I mean, th these data appear to be very hard. They're very concrete. They're very specific. And yet, when you look at the qualitative background, you see how so many things are come into play which perhaps are not accounted for. And also, there remains the basic question of how complete are these data? Is it really all cases of homicide during the period. So, and this raises another question, which is the blurring of the line between judge and jury decision making. Um, it was very true at the time, and it's true now. The judge can have a very important influence, even though technically the jury decides sentence. It was extremely important in Haymarket, so much so that many commentators commented upon it. And, you know, so may, maybe that isn't such a bright line distinction. Absolutely. In fact, that's what, that's my ultimate conclusion from the, uh, from my analysis, mm -hmm. that it had to be some eff effect transmitted from the judge uh, and the, the uh, that judge's concern for re-election mm -hmm. uh, through evidentiary rulings, through jury instructions, so forth, that would account for this result, um, given that the judges weren't actually deciding. I might also say that your question really sparks, uh, I think, an important point about how connected this historical research is to current research. Um, there has been for some time sort of anecdotal accounts of this, t this pattern of judicial sensitivity to elections and that it might actually corrupt the process when it comes to capital cases. Judge Stevens um, talked about it extensively in various opinions, and there were many newspaper articles about it. And it's actually an, a, a rich debate right now. To my knowledge, there hasn't been any careful study identifying it empirically. Um, and there have been um, studies. There's a, a, a wonderful piece by a couple economists at, um, at Syracuse. Uh, entitled Lethal Elections, where they find that during a governor's election year, the chances of receiving clemency decline for uh, um, uh, prisoners on, on death row by roughly 25 percent. Um, but then Michael Heiss has this new piece out challenging the gubernatorial. Uh -huh. So the, there, there is conflicting uh, statistical uh, evidence concerning whether or not governors are responding in their decisions about clemency. So, uh, which puts into question this, uh, th whether or not judges are actually doing the same thing. And, and of course, all we do is identify that it appears that they were doing so in, uh, you know, b before 1930 in Chicago. It calls for more work. Uh, there, there is some more work going on. Uh, looking at non-capital cases, uh, someone has identified that judges are roughly 30 percent more punitive in criminal, non-capital criminal cases in Pennsylvania currently. But actually, I think the real key, the importance of what we did is that we sparked, uh, by looking at, at using this data set, we, we, I think we're, we've triggered some more interest. We've highlighted that this can be identified and hopefully, and maybe we'll participate, but if not others, we'll track down more currently what these patterns are of election and capital cases. And, if, and the, ob the, the importance of it is, is, is obvious. The other thing I really like about your paper and find very fresh is the marriage between the very hard, rigorous quantitative analysis and the quantitative analysis and the historical background. So you get a very strong um, statistical statement, but it's not bare. So much of the quantitative work which is done is just bare without any context, and your work is not that. Well, that actually turned out to be really uh, a, a fun and interesting part of the project for me. I found myself spending a lot of time in the Cook County uh, archives. Uh, one of the things we had to do, for instance, was to identify all the judges uh, that we looked at and figure out when they were being elected. When, when were they coming up for elections? And, what, what the, and we also wanted to know what the results were. It turned out that the, there are a variety of 
courts and judges who could hear criminal cases. And just to learn about the way the criminal courts functioned, the judges actually weren't elected to the Cook County criminal courts. They were largely elected to the Superior Court and the Circuit Court and then they were assigned to the criminal courts. And they generally didn't want to be assigned to the criminal courts, I found, as I read through the, uh, the historical accounts. Richard, this is actually a wonderful example of the interaction between formal and informal law, which anyone who practices criminal law now sees around them all the time. You'd think that it would be a matter of criminal procedure or rule as to who gets who assigned where, but we all know that there's often a lot of politics involved and manipulation and that it isn't always so clear. So um, we know that that happened in this historical period too. In fact, we have a wonderful contemporaneous account by a judge who was a chief judge of the court about how assignments were done, particularly assignments in the critical criminal court and how that was manipulated by the party. So, you know, we were, we were greatly helped by that account and that judge must have been much vilified and criticized for publishing this account in a newspaper. Absolutely. So not only are ju were judges strategically uh, placed on the bench, the criminal bench, uh, it was sort of considered a coup when you were up for a re-election to sit on the criminal courts. Uh, you had a lot of newspaper publicity right. available right. Um, to you. But also the assignment of cases, which were in theory, at least the, when you read the rules uh, of the, uh, and, and which is, points out another important factor. So there the statistical, mm -hmm. so based on assumptions that judges were elected, and if you wanted to figure out uh, how they got their cases, you might look at the sort of the written record, uh, the official written record, and learn that, well, they were random assignments. So that means that for our statistical model, we didn't have to control for things because it was all random anyway. Um, a nice advantage, but then once you read more carefully the accounts from this judge and others, you realize that the assignment of the cases were also fairly biased, and Very not biased, necessarily right. in bad ways. Cases may just have been assigned to a particular judge mm -hmm. because uh, he was more capable or had a greater facility, it was, uh, at least that was the perception among some, and of course cases were assigned for po political purposes as well. Well, this is actually a very interesting example and a very concrete example of how the party was able to manipulate and control the legal system by judicial assignment, uh, by deciding when police were going to make a raid of the saloons or the houses of prostitution. So the party was able to deliver the legal system. And this was a very big benefit for all sorts of people. Absolutely. And you begin to see the connections once you start sort of uncovering the historical uh, materials. For instance, um, Robert Crow, who was the state's attorney, the lead prosecutor for the state during much of this period, was also the head of the Republican ticket uh, party. So he was not only involved in sort of deciding who would be litig who would be face charges, he was also uh, the person, the individual, who would decide which judges would sit a, a, and that he would argue before. So it was, it was uh, that politics had a rich connection. And you really could not uncover that story either by looking at the official account or using the large uh, st uh, data set statistical analyses that we employed. You really did have to do sort of meaningful historical uh, research and, and 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 at the same time doing that uh, broader analysis was able to shed light back on and uh, uh, maybe confirmation uh, for what you the, sort of these political stories that, that that come out of the historical analysis so uh, it, it's a merger uh, of methodologies that makes both stronger in the final analysis Richard this is just another example of how fortunate we are in working in this period uh, because of the progressive movement, but not just the progressives, but because of the development of sociology and criminology during the period and the participation of the educated elite in the court system, in the juvenile court, in uh, working for women's rights. Uh, we have a very strong record
and commentary upon the practices of the legal system and the historical context and the sociological context. And that really enriches our legal research greatly. Yeah, you know, one of the advantages of doing work of almost of any sort uh, on Ch um, when it comes to in Chicago uh, in this period is that Chicago is such a well-studied uh, city. The sociologists uh, that, that, that you mentioned, and, and for my other work on housing, the sociologists out of the Chicago School, uh, they, they have provided, so, so much of my research is informed by master's theses of their students, not to mention their own work. It's, uh, it really does help a lot in the analysis, and it, it, it's almost as though I have a jump on you do. what yeah, others yes. who were looking at other cities might have. And then I get to go a little bit deeper and I get to push and tweak in ways that I, I think are unavailable in, um, for, for populations and, and cities that are as well um, recorded. It's amazing, really. We have an intellectual re renaissance here in Chicago, and so much is produced and so much good work is done. And then that later gets built upon by work in later generations in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. So it just enriches our research and enables us to make a deeper study of what's going on in Chicago. I agree. Richard, thank you so much for this interview and I hope you will continue to do research both using this data set and on Chicago. And I look forward to seeing that. Thank you.